Good evening. We're about to. Good evening, everyone. I'm Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez. Thank you so very much. In a day like today, to be here is really inspiring. There is no other way to describe it. So thank you so much and for everyone, not only the community, the stakeholders, but the uh, agencies that are, be, that are represented uh, here tonight. And I want first and foremost uh, thank those who are hosting us, uh, Charlene Neimans, Wyckoff Gardens, Ed Tyree, Gowanus Houses, Harriet Hughes, Warren Street Houses, and it's a great pleasure to see many residents from these three developments here. I would also like to recognize the staff from NYCHA who will address flooding and prevention measures, Luis Ponce and Brian Honan, who is the Legislative Affairs. And I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you. You have been involved throughout this process and because of the work, participation of the community, CAC, the advisory board, board, uh, members, we have today a good plan, a good cleanup plan that is giving us a better strategy because of the input and feedback that has been provided by everyone. Your input, your participation really is invaluable. And I, will, I just want to recognize the EPA team, from Judith Eng, who is not here, uh, to the Superfund director, Walter Mogdan, Gowana's project manager, Christos Siamis, and Natalie Loni, EPA community involvement coordinator. We are also being uh, joined by NYC DEC, who will address the issue of sewer backups and flooding, as well as NYCHA. Uh, I believe that Eric Landau is here. Good. Welcome. He is the Deputy Commissioner for Public Affairs. Associate. Okay. Sure. Well, you know, that, that structure from City Hall. You know. Kevin Clark, Engineering Design and Construction. On, and Tommy Morama, water and sewer, sewer operations. And from CAC, Gowana's Advisory Committee, I want to thank Sabine Aranowski, Ariel Krasnow, and uh, you will be, thank you because you asked me to convene this meeting so that we have a better understanding as to where we are today and to establish a better collaboration among the agencies that will be involved. Since the beginning of this process, one of the top priorities of mine, as well as the other elected officials, has been ensuring community involvement and input. And I must say that EPA, under the leadership of Judith Eng, kept this in mind throughout. That is why the inclusive process implemented by EPA has yielded a better strategy. And going forward, we must continue working to ensure the public is familiar and comfortable with how the canal is remediated. And that is important to not only have the meetings with CAC and call some of the meetings in other parts of the uh, Gowanus community, but also to bring these meetings here. I need and I want to see more participation from public housing residents. This is a process that is going to also impact these developments. And as well, we need to be prepared because throughout the implementation of this plan, we need to be ready because jobs will be created, and that is why I asked Judith Eng uh, to implement a job training institute the same way that you did it in Passaic. 
in New Jersey, and that will be good for the community. So we now have a comprehensive cleanup plan that will benefit our community. And as we all know, this plan is gonna cost over $500 million, but taxpayers will not be paying for that cleanup responsible, the primary responsible polluters are the ones paying for this cleanup. And also it's worth noting that contaminated sedi sediments will be shipped out of New York to, uh, to be disposed properly away from our community. The plan also includes controls to prevent raw sewage overflows, CSO, and other land-based sources of contamination from compromising the cleanup. And the EPA is requiring that combined sewer overflow from two major outfalls, city pipes in the upper portion of the canal, be outfitted with controls to reduce the volume. EPA has required that the city address this by the use of overflow tanks. New York City Department of Environmental Protection has joined us tonight and they will be explaining to us where they are in the siding of those tanks. So this is gonna take a long time. I just asked Walter again, uh, what is the timeline? It's gonna take between eight, 10 years, but it's gonna take much less than the cleanup of the Newtown Creek. And I'm excited about that because when we were trying for the Army Corps to do something here, I was trying for something to be done regarding cleaning up the Gowanus Canal, I was able to secure funding for uh, the Army Corps. And they were able to collect data that now is gonna be used uh, by EPA, and that by itself will reduce the timeline of the cleanup. So I would like to thank EPA and the community for the work that you have done to this day, and we have, as I mentioned, a long way to go, but today marks an important milestone, and I'm proud of how far we have come. And together, we're gonna be very proud of the results that we are going to witness in the next 10 years for the Gowanus Canal, the Gowanus Canal community, and for Brooklyn and New York City. So I would like to ask Walter Mugdan uh, to introduce the EPA staff to give us uh, some brief remarks regarding where we are today. Walter. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. And again, thanks to all of you for turning out. It's a kind of a bleak, dreary, wet night, so we really appreciate you all coming out. Um, as the Congresswoman said, I'm joined here with a couple of other members of uh, the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Natalie Loney, who many of you know, is our Community Involvement Coordinator for this site. She uh, happens to be a Brooklyn resident as well. She lives not far from here. She's been in the community a lot. She's worked with many of you, and she is available to any of you if you have questions. And in a few moments, she's going to give a little presentation using uh, the slide projector here to tell you a little bit more about how the so-called Superfund process works. Superfund is the nickname for the law, the federal government law under which we're carrying out this cleanup. Uh, the formal name is real long and boring, but everybody calls it Superfund. Uh, there actually used to be a fund for it that was super, but we still use the name. I'm also joined here by Don Dearden, who is our uh, Division of Public Affairs Director, and Barry Shore, who's in our uh, Public Affairs Office. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of a sense of where we are, just over one year ago, on September 30th of last year, we announced our final cleanup decision for the Gowanus Canal. And uh, the Congresswoman was there and others were there. And what we said is there's gonna be two major components to the cleanup. One major component to the cleanup is that the heavily contaminated mud that's in the bottom of the canal, and it can be as much as 10 feet thick in some places, and it's got a tremendous amount of gunk in it, bad stuff, uh, that's gonna be removed. It's gonna be dredged out, and as the Congresswoman said, it's going to be managed carefully and then shipped away to authorized 
appropriate disposal locations outside of the New York area. In addition, underneath the mud, the contamination still goes down probably another 100 feet underground. We won't be able to dig all of that out. But what we can do and what we will do is to isolate the remaining contaminated sand and soil and dirt that's deep down, isolate that from being in, con in, in any kind of contact with the water or with the critters that live in the water and that we want to have more of. And so we will do something called capping. Once we have dug out all the thick, deep mud that we actually call black mayonnaise, because it has the consistency of mayonnaise, uh, once we dig that all out, then we're going to put a cap down over the material that's below, which is a sandy sort of material. And in some cases, we're even going to solidify that sandy material. So we're actually going to mix it with concrete underwater and make it hard. And the purpose is to prevent the deep, deep, deep contamination from making its way back up into the canal, into the water, and things of that sort. Uh, so that is sort of the main idea for the canal itself. But there's a second major element to the cleanup, and that is that, as the Congresswoman said, uh, there are, in the canal, and this is similar to many places around the city of New York, and for that matter, most older cities in the United States, we have what's called a combined sewer system in many parts of the city, which means that the sewage that comes when you flush the toilet or when you run your shower or when you wash your dishes, that goes into pipes in the streets, and those pipes eventually go to a sewage treatment plant where that's cleaned up and made very, very clean. But when it rains and the rainwater goes into the drains and the gutters on the streets, in many places in New York, those go into the exact same pipes. That rainwater goes into the same pipes. And intentionally, the way it was designed, is that the pipes are big enough to carry the sewage from our homes and our businesses, but they're not big enough to carry the sewage plus the rainwater. So at low places, like the Gowanus Canal, where it's near the water, near the open water of the ocean or of the bay, there's a combined sewer overflow. And so when it's raining and there's too much liquid in the sewer, the excess rainwater plus sewage goes into the canal. And because the canal is so narrow and relatively shallow, and because the tide doesn't move back and forth all that well in it, uh, the, the sewage that gets into the canal here is actually even a bigger concern than it is in some other parts of the city of New York, where you have bigger areas that it goes into. So here we concluded, we, US EPA concluded, that in addition to dredging out the heavily contaminated muck in the canal, we also may want to make sure that after we spend hundreds of millions of dollars cleaning that muck up, that we don't make it dirty again by allowing as much sewage to get in as is getting in there today. So we determined in our decision that we reached a year ago uh, that there would have to be a very significant reduction in the amount of this combined sewer, combined sewage material that goes in when it rains. That's the good news, at least in terms of what most people who live around here would, would believe. Uh, but nothing in the world comes easy, especially not when you're dealing with a very heavily, you know, heavily densely built up area like New York City. And in order to build the tanks that are going to be necessary to capture this extra sewage and rainwater when it rains, uh, the city of New York, which is responsible for doing this, is going to have to find a location to build those tanks. And you're going to hear a little bit more from the New York City Department of Environmental Protection colleagues who are here, and they'll talk to you about their selection process for the site. And I know that there are some elements of that that may be of concern to you. I'm sure we'll end up talking about it this evening. But at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Natalie and just ask her to give a little presentation about introducing you to the Superfund program. Some of you have seen this, have, have seen this before, but it'll be new to some of you. Natalie? Thank you, Walter. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming out in the rain. Um, I wanted to kind of go through the cycle of a Superfund site. 
Um, we've been using that term a lot, and I know there are some, some um, folk in the community who are very, at this point, very familiar with what Superfund is and what Superfund isn't. Um, but I, I want to take some time to really kind of take you step by step through this whole process. There are a lot of agencies who are present here. There's New York City DEP, there's the state DEC, there's EPA. Um, and trying to decide who is responsible for what and how what role you play in all of that can be somewhat complicated. So I want to kind of go step by step of how we got to where we are today. Um, I started with this great montage. These are some images that I had on my computer, of all things, um, that kind of gives a, a sense of all the different viewpoints, not all, but some of the different viewpoints that we're seeing in, in, um, in this area with regard to the Gowanus Canal. So Walter kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. What exactly is Superfund? Superfund is a federal program that is designed to remediate hazardous waste sites. Now their Superfund sites fall really into two categories when you think about it. Those are their sites where Superfund dollars or tax dollars are used to pay for the cleanup of the site. That's when the polluter no longer is viable, viable, doesn't have the money or they may no longer exist. That's when your tax dollars and my tax dollars are used to clean up a site. And in other types of sites, there's a PRP, the Potentially Responsible Party. That entity that is responsible for the contamination, they foot the bill for cleaning up the site. And fortunately, in the case of the Gowanus Canal, there are several um, viable and liable PRPs, potentially responsible parties, who will be paying for the cleanup. So your money and my money will not be used at this site. Um, this little road map, it looks a little bit funny, and we're not really good on graphics, um, but it kind of gives you a sense of, of what the Superfund process looks like. We're, we're, right about, we're right about here, and those acronyms, I'll, as I'm going through each step, they'll become a little bit clearer. So in order to really get a sense of, of the Gowanus Canal and how it became a Superfund site, we need to go back about 145 years. About 145 years ago, this area obviously didn't look anything like it does today. There used to be um, Gowanus Creek, this, this water body. Um, and in 18, 1869, New York City built the Gowanus Canal. How did they build it? They filled in that original water body and they created what you see here as the Gowanus Canal. Um, Bulkheads were built up along the sides, and those former water bodies in the creek were filled in. So now you have this Gowanus Canal that was built. Why? Well, because it was, an, it was a waterway. This is before roads and trucks and all those things and rail lines were available, and water was the easiest way to transport goods. Now, in 1869, Brooklyn was a booming, wonderful city. Um, and a lot of construction was taking place, and so much of the material that has been used to build Brownstone Brooklyn came up this Gowanus Canal. When the city built it, they closed up the end of the canal. It didn't have an, it, there was no way for water to come into the top of the canal. Um, and very shortly after the canal was, was built, it became, it was, it was determined to be a bit of a nuisance because runoff, sewage, the industries that cropped up along the canal contributed to the contamination in the canal itself. And so in 1877, the Board of Health determined that the Gowanus Canal was a nuisance. No fresh water was coming in um, to the canal. So New York City at that time responded by building what you all know at the he head of Butler Street. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this building. They built this outfall and sewage was introduced into the canal as a way to flush it. Clearly that was not the best method, but at that time it seemed like a good idea. Um, right after that sewage um, line, made, those sewage mains were added, it didn't really do what it was intended to do. It didn't increase flow into the canal. And in 1911, the flushing tunnel was built. 
you're familiar with the Flushing Tunnel. And that Flushing Tunnel actually links the um, Gowanus Canal through an underground tunnel to Buttermilk Channel. And fresh water came in from Buttermilk Channel. That's that water body between Brooklyn and Governor's Island. Water was coming in through the Flushing Tunnel to the head of the canal, and that was able to pump fresh water and try to alleviate some of the odors and some of the other complaints the community had about the, about the Gowanus Canal. Unfortunately, in 1965, that Flushing Tunnel broke down. But since then, New York City has made major improvements to the Flushing Tunnel, and it's um, functioning again. So, I made mention of the fact that that Gowanus Canal, that water body, was used as a um, mode of transportation of goods into the booming city of Brooklyn. I keep saying booming city of Brooklyn because as a Brooklynite, I take great pride in my city. Um, nevertheless, along the canal, several types of industries cropped up. There were tanneries, there were dye manufacturers. I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the major industries that ended up contaminating the canal. And this, this is one of them. This is a manufactured gas plant. Um, what, in, in the turn of the century, people used gas as a mode of heating and lighting their homes. And the way that gas was produced, they would take coal, which was very plentiful and relatively inexpensive source of energy. They would heat up, these, these plants would heat up the coal and gas would come off of the coal. They would capture that and pipe it to people's homes. The residuals from the heating of the of that coal was something called coal tar. Coal tar is the major contributor to um, contamination at the canal. Um, coal tar was a waste product. And so at that time, there were no environmental regulations, and coal tar was just disposed of at the sites. It ended up sinking into the ground under many of these properties. And over the past hundred years or so, it not only has migrated through the ground, it has now migrated into the canal itself. And there were three manufactured gas plants um, along the canal. One of them is where the Double D Park is. The second one is further down um, where right across from it's, it's called a public place right, right behind the, um, which, what's the name of that, that, construct, that, uh, that cement co concern? Ferrara Thank Ferrara. you, right behind Ferrara Brothers. And the third one is where the Lowe's and uh, Pathmark is now located. So those were the major um, coal tar menu, those were the major gas companies, and those are the major sources of contamination into the canal. Um, so let's move forward. Now we've kind of talked about what the canal looked like, how it was built, and what the sources, some of the sources of contamination were. How did it actually become a Superfund site after a hundred or something years? Well, the first thing that happens is that um, we do something called a preliminary assessment, a site inspection. And EPA was um, actually, we got a request from the the State Department of Environmental Conservation, um, in order for a Superfund site to be listed, EPA has to be notified. You know, there's a site out here, we think there might be a problem, could you come look at it? And this is what happened here. The, the New York State Department of Envi Environmental Conservation sent a letter to our then regional administrator, Alan Steinberg, requesting that the Gowanus Canal be placed on the NPL. Now, when that happened, that triggered a whole bunch of actions on the part of EPA. We did our initial assessment, we did our site investigation, and there's a whole process that any site has to go through in order to be placed on the Superfund list. And for some of you who were there at the very beginning of this process, um, we compiled a whole bunch of information. In addition, we had a comment period, and we received hundreds of comments from the community, some saying, please make this a Superfund site, some saying, please don't make this a Superfund site. But EPA based its decision on the science. And we found that the conditions at the Gowanus Canal necessitated that it be placed on the NPL list. And in March of 2010, it was officially named a Superfund site. So 
what did that mean? We, I, I said we did our assessment. We went through that listing process. It was placed on the Superfund list. Now the Gowanus Canal was no longer just the Gowanus Canal. It was now the Gowanus Canal Superfund site. And so there were other activities that were triggered as a, as a result of that. We went into something, you'll notice there are going to be a slew of acronyms. Federal government, we love acronyms for some reason. I guess talking words, too arduous. So RIFS as opposed to Remedial Investigation Feasibility Study. That's what I'm talking about here. What is the RIFS? What's a Remedial Investigation and a Feasibility Study? All it is is we're looking at the nature and extent of contamination at a site and what are feasible options for addressing that contamination. Um, and so we went through that process on the Gowanus. Um, the, the Congresswoman mentioned that studies had been done through her, um, through her efforts by the Army Corps of Engineers. So we already had some, um, some scientific and technical information and that helped to expedite the process of site investigation. Um, and so we relatively quickly moved from investigation to presenting what we call our proposed remedial action plan. So the site was listed, we investigated the site, we looked at feasible options for, for cleaning it up, and then we presented what our proposed plan for addressing the contamination at the site was. That from that, we made our final decision as to what the remedy would be, and that's that next step, the record of decision. Uh, these are some of the photographs of, of what the activities took place at the canal during that remedial investigation. Um, this is actually a crew, this long pole right here, I don't know if the folk in the back can see it, but this was actually inserted into the bottom of the canal through that, those layer of sediment that had accumulated. And this is what, this is what came up. This is what the, co the contamination at the bottom of the canal looks like. So this is some of the sediment that's just on the surface of the bottom. And this is, as you, as you continue down through that 100 and something years worth of contamination, that, well, that's what you're gonna find. It's the combination of coal tar, and some of the stuff that's coming out of the sewers and other sources from industries along the canal. Uh, this is a schematic of what we're looking at at the canal. Remember at the beginning of the presentation, I spoke about how the canal was man-made, that original water body was filled in. So this is kind of a, a, a cross view of what the canal looks like. Here, this was the original bottom of the canal. This is the areas that were filled in. And here are the bulkheads alongside of the ca canal. At the bottom of the canal, you see this, this dark gray mass. That's that sediment, that photograph you saw a little bit earlier. And as Walter mentioned, it can be anywhere from 10 to 20 feet thick in certain places in the canal. It averages about, about 10 feet. We mentioned the, the sediment, we mentioned the CSOs. This is, these, these are examples of the kinds of sheens that you can expect to see. I'm sure many of you have walked across bridges on the canal and you look over into the water and you sometimes see an oily sheen on the, on the surface of the water. That is the coal tar. As, as I said, not only, does it, not only has it migrated down through the soil, it has now migrated into the bottom of the canal, and some of the lighter constituents of that coal tar, occasionally in warm weather, will rise up to the surface, and the really light ones, you'll get, you'll get these oil sheens, or sometimes you'll actually get little globs of, of coal tar. So you can actually, on certain occasions, see the contamination at the canal. Here's an example. This is the this is this is the uh, the the uh, metal reclamation um, facility directly across the street from Lowe's. Here's the Lowe's parking lot, that little uh, park esplanade, and you can see there's a large there's a large sheen there. The the uh, Lowe's location that also was a, a manufactured gas facility. So there's a lot of coal tar at that location as well. We spoke about the sources of contamination 
from the manufactured gas plants and the other industries along the canal. There's another source that Walter made mention of. This is the infamous, um, we call it the Punami. After uh, a heavy rainstorm, the sewage that could not be shipped out, could not be pumped to the sewage treatment plant, that overflow came into the canal. And you can actually see this dark water here. You see this is, this is as, it, as it comes down from the top of the canal, down through the water. You can see clearly the line of demarcation between sewage, between dilated sewage and what was existing in the canal. So those are ongoing sources, particularly after heavy rains, of contamination to the canal. So let's look at, we've, I'm going, going back to that map again. We've already done our investigation. It was listed. We came up with the remedy, um, that record of decision, that final decision as to what EPA has determined to be the best course of action in remediating the site. Now, what did we decide would be the best thing for us to do? We've broken up the canal into three sections. This, here's where we are somewhere off the map. Um, but here, from the top of the canal, right to before the first turning basin, that's the first area. The second ends right, right about where the Gowanus Expressway is. And the third is from the Gowanus Expressway to the mouth of the canal. Those are the three areas that EPA has broken the canal into, and those are the three areas that we will be addressing one after the other. We'll first be dredging area one. It'll take about two years or so. Then on to area two, and finally on to area three. So between two and three years per each area, so it gives you anywhere about nine or so. So in about 2022, we hope to have remediated the entire canal. Now, what does that remediation consist of? We made mention of dredging, that contaminated material, that muck will be removed, and then capping it. But that's not the only thing that the plan consists of. We will be removing the contaminated sediment from the canal. We'll be capping the, the dredged areas again. Remember that contamination, this is a hundred or an, uh, more than a hundred years worth of contamination in some places. Not only has it affected the surface of the canal, but it, the contamination actually has gone down into the original sediment. We can't remove a hundred feet of contaminated material. So we will be solidifying and capping those areas. In addition, um, the sewer overflows, that photograph I showed you of the Punami, that's where those two tanks come in. EPA has, decide, has determined that the best way to address the continued contamination coming into the canal from the sewers is to build two holding tanks. Those tanks would be responsible of capturing that first flush. When the rain first comes in, instead of it going into the canal, it would be held in those retention tanks until the rain passes, and then it could be pumped to the sewage treatment plant, and everything moves on accordingly. What does that cap look like? When we're talking about a cap, it's a multi-layered cap to make sure that that contamination, remember we spoke about the original sediment at the bottom of the canal, there's certain places where that too is contaminated. So what we would do is we would solidify a layer of that, and then on top of that, we would place a treatment layer, sand and gravel, and then a heavier gravel material, and then finally at the top would be a habitat layer. By habitat layer, we're, tr we're looking to put on the bottom of the canal um, matter that would uh, afford um, animal life and uh, plant life to actually grow um, and thrive at the bottom of the canal. Um, so where are we? Right now, we're in this section, the remedial design. Um, we have already made the decision as to what the remedy will be, and right now, the PRPs, those potentially responsible parties, they're in the process of actually designing the remedy that EPA has determined will be applied at the canal. 
And so National Grid and all the other PRPs are looking at, or are in consultation, and we've met with them on multiple occasions um, to talk about exactly what that design will consist of. It's one thing to say we're going to dredge. It's another thing to actually design what is the methodology, when will we dredge, how much will we dredge, what kind of dredging techniques are going to be used. So it takes a little time. One thing is to come up with the concept, the other thing is to actually design and implement. So we expect in about 2016, 2017, that we will actually be starting work in the first section, the topmost section of the, of the Gowanus Canal. And then two years later, that middle section, and another two or three years later, that final section. So by the end of all of that, we hope to hit this target, which is construction completion. There are some Superfund sites where there's groundwater and you have to keep pumping and treating and pumping and treating. The Gowanus Canal is a little bit different. It's not a constant um, iteration of removing water, treating it and, and, and um, re-injecting it. Here, the remedy is relatively straightforward. Remove the contamination from the canal, cap it, move on to the second section, remove the contamination, ship it off site, cap it, and build the retention tanks to make sure that the sources of contamination that are coming from the sewers are no longer going to impact the canal to a great extent. In addition, walls, cutoff walls have to be built so that those sources of contamination, remember I told you about the three former manufactured gas plants at the top, the middle, and the end of the canal? We want to make sure that the contamination from those facilities no longer get into the canal. It doesn't make sense to clean up a canal and not have a way to stop the contamination from coming in. So that's another component of the remedy. Um, once, the, once, the site is, once the site is completed, um, there is the potential of a site being deleted from the, from the NPL list. There are many sites where once it's, once it's been cleaned up and it's met its remedial action goals, um, a site has a potential of being removed. And that may, at some point in the future, happen at the Gowanus Canal. That doesn't mean that EPA would no longer keep, in its, keep its eye on the canal, but it would then be, it would no longer be called the Gowanus Canal Superfund site. It could just be called the Gowanus Canal, unless they want to rename it to, I don't know, the Velasquez Canal or something like that. <laughs> um, and so the, the goal of the Superfund program is not only to clean up, um, clean up contaminated sites, but really we, the whole objective is to make sure that, that that particular site is now available for reuse by a community. Um, right now, the canal is not being used to the extent that it could be should it be cleaned up. And so the long-term goal, apart from cleaning up the contamination, EPA will be very happy, probably not as happy as the community, but we will be very happy with a clean canal that can be used in the way that the community would like that to happen. And I think that's it. I don't have any more slides. Right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie, for an incredible overview of the uh, cleanup plan and uh, how do we get where we are today. Thank you so very much. And you worked so hard in making sure that we provide a process for community participation. Very important to me. I just would like to uh, acknowledge and ask him to say a few words because I know that you might have some other commitments. Our Councilman Brad Lander. Thank you very much. Wonderful to be back here. Uh, the, sadly, the Wyckoff Community Center and Wyckoff Gardens are not in my council district. For those of you who don't know, I'm Councilmember Brad Lander. Steve Levin is the council member here. We work very closely together, and I represent most of the area around the canal. I want to say special thank yous to the Congresswoman and the EPA. Um, it really is their work together that has gotten us here, made it possible for this process to be underway, for us to be able to see a path to a clean canal, which people have been talking about for generations. You know, the canal hit zero dissolved oxygen, I think the year they estimated is 1906, 
so it has been a long process getting to, uh, to this point, um, and it really is because of the uh, great advocacy of people in the community, the champion work of the Congresswoman, um, and the dedicated work of the EPA, and there's also been a lot of effort to reach out and engage the community, much more than I've seen in most uh, government and public processes, certainly more than in most federal government processes. So um, I give credit to the EPA on that. That said, um, you know, there hasn't, still for all, there hasn't been enough engagement in public housing with the NYCHA residents here. And so I appreciate the Congresswoman setting this meeting up so people here can understand, ask questions. Um, there's a lot of questions I know you'll have about specifically the Superfund, and then there are many other important things that are related to the canal cleanup, and we're all doing our best to think about how they connect to each other. So last time I was here, I was hearing an earful about the sewage backups here and across the street at, at Warren Street uh, houses, or excuse me, you know, and so we know that there's, you know, that that's one of the issues. Now that's not about the Superfund cleanup, but it sure is about a related set of issues. So I'm glad that, uh, that Eric Landau's here from from DEP, they are working also on a high-level storm sewers project, because if you go down to President or Carroll Street and Fourth Avenue, they'll tell you it floods when it rains. So yes, one problem is the CSOs flowing into the canal, and another problem is that it floods on Fourth Avenue and Carroll Street every time we get a heavy rain. What are we gonna do about that? So something's underway from DEP to work on that, but there's, there's you know, a ways to go. There's the brownfield cleanups around the canal, um, and we've also started a process that some of you were at because we had our, uh, one of the big public meetings right in this room, a process for thinking about some of the future land use and planning and infrastructure uh, questions for the area surrounding the canal and what do we want to see there given that the cleanup is coming, given that we've seen what it looks like when a hurricane hits, given that there's a lot of real estate pressures around and we want to think about how do we preserve and strengthen what we most love about our, our neighborhood and our community? So all of those things are, you know, um, connected, um, and we've been working together to understand them, uh, talk and listen and have dialogue and keep moving them forward together. So uh, it's great to have this meeting. The real, the driver of all of them uh, is the Superfund cleanup and getting the canal clean, uh, but obviously all those other issues are important as well. So. Um, I have to run out to another meeting shortly, but I'll stay for a few minutes. Um, I look really forward to continuing that dialogue with you as we move forward in partnership with the EPA and the Congresswoman, and also as we work with DEP and NYCHA uh, and so many other partners in really advancing um, not only sustainability and clean canal, but um, a broader set of sustainability for what a neighborhood can look like that works for its residents, that preserves the things we care about, that invests in a sustainable future, um, and that does its best, the best we possibly can to be working together going forward on all those big, tough issues. So thank you very much for putting this together, thank Congresswoman. You. Thank you for your presence here. I also would like to acknowledge that we have staff from the offices of Assemblywoman John Millman, State Senator Bellman at Montgomery, Councilman Steve Levin, who is doing his participatory budget this um, yes. And Scott Stringer office is also represented and here. here. Yeah. So now it's my pleasure to call upon the D DP and um, and NYCHA should follow. Thank you, Congresswoman. Can you hear me without the mic? They need the mic for the, yeah, no, like you need the mic for the, okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, Congresswoman, uh, very much. Uh, and thank you, uh, EPA and Councilman and everyone else for being here. Um, the Councilman uh, really just said, said it best in terms of there's a lot that's going on in Gowanus. There's a lot that DEP is involved in here in Gowanus. Um, you know, obviously uh, tonight we're talking primarily about the Superfund, as well as um, some concerns that we heard last month, Commissioner Lloyd was, was in this room last month talking to the community specifically about the CSO tank siting and that process, and we heard some concerns from NYCHA residents um, about sewer backups and when it rains, and so uh, I'm glad that our colleagues from NYCHA are here tonight and we can talk a little bit about that too. Um, but there's a, a lot of that's going on, the Councilman mentioned the high-level storm sewer project that we're, do, that we're working on uh, right now, if you 
Um, you probably noticed that the utility companies are starting that work, um, uh, and that's caused some disruption, and I believe uh, the community board is looking to have a, a meeting uh, later this fall where DEP, the utility companies, DDC, will come and talk about what's happening with that project and how that will impact and, and the benefits that will have. That project, is, as the councilman said, is, is really all about flooding. Um, however, it will have a, a CSO benefit to it as well. It's sort of the added bonus of that project, reducing um, CSOs uh, in the canal. Uh, in addition, we're engaged in what we call a long-term control plan. That's working with the State Department of Environmental Conservation on reducing CSOs in the Gowanus Canal. And uh, the process that we engage with long-term control plans is we start with a kickoff meeting where we talk with the community about the canal and about what CSOs are and about what uh, remediation efforts we can take. And that meeting is going to be happening in the middle of November. Um, Someone told me the other day, and, I, and I'm not sure if this is true, this may be the first time that uh, we're working with both the federal government and the state government in the same location on the same goal. Um, so that's, that's, that is quite an accomplishment, absolutely. Um, so we are, um, so there's a lot that's happening. Um, one of the other things that we're doing, uh, you've probably heard us talk about green infrastructure, uh, and you may have heard the term bioswale. What is a bioswale? So a bioswale looks like a large tree pit You've probably seen some of them uh, here in Gowanus. There are a few uh, that we've worked uh, very closely with um, the Congresswoman and the Gowanus Canal Conservancy on. Um, uh, Bioswales look like big tree pits, uh, and they are specifically engineered to capture storm water um, as it's coming down the street so it doesn't head to the, the wastewater treatment plant and doesn't therefore um, overflow. Uh, and so there, um, there are 91, I think I have that number right, 91 swells that will be coming to the Gowanus. We're doing 6,000 of them citywide over the next several years. Um, so several of them coming to Gowanus. They will not only green the streets, provide more oxygen because they're plant life, but they will have a significant benefit in stormwater management um, and therefore uh, reducing CSOs. So there's a lot happening. Last month, as I mentioned, Commissioner Lloyd was here talking about tank siting, um, as our colleagues in EPA just mentioned. Oh, great. Um, yeah. Uh, if we can, that'd be great. I'll keep talking if you guys, thank you very much. Sure. Um, yeah, it's going to be a little hard. Yeah, it's going to be a little hard. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so the commissioner came, uh, we were in this room uh, last month talking about the tank siting and the specific process that we were undergoing. I think everyone knows that we started with about 86 potential sites for two, uh, for two storage tanks, one um, at the, the top end of the canal and the other at the mouth of the canal. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much. Um, the process was that by the end of September, we would respond to EPA and narrow down that list of 86 sites to two potential locations per tank site. Um, so again, thank you. All right, technology not my thing. That's okay. Um, so two locations for, for this outfall, two locations for that outfall. Um, and the commissioner walked everyone through how we narrowed that process, the process we used to narrow from 86 down to 14 total. I think it was uh, uh, eight sites for, uh, for what we call Red Hook 034 and six for what we call Owl's Head 007. Um, and the process that we were going to take from there from the middle of September th to the end of September to narrow that down to the two and two locations. Uh, at the end of the month, we did, and the, excuse me, the criteria involved both um, environmental components and engineering components, looking at its location, for example, to the outfalls, um, looking at, um, Kevin, help me out with some of the, the other. Oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 I apologize. I thought EPA had done that. So the, the outfalls, as, um, as had been stated earlier, exactly when we do have a combined sewer overflow where it falls out into the canal. Uh, current surrounding land use, right. Um, so we narrowed it down to two sites and two sites that we submitted to EPA using a criteria that allowed us to quantify and numerically rank them on like entities. Um, and the two locations that we discussed, that we identified for, for here, RH double, uh, RH 034 at the top of the end of the canal. Uh, site one is right here. Sorry, my hand's in the way. Um, and that is, uh, for those of you uh, less familiar than I, uh, which probably is not many, uh, 
uh, that's uh, bounded by Gowanus Canal, Butler Street, Nevin Street, and Sackett Street. Um, that was what we listed as the highest ranking site based on this criteria. And then the second site, again, based on this criteria, was here, the Thomas Green Playground, the Double D Pool. Can you guys see where I'm pointing in the back? No, nope. so yeah, maybe we can zoom in, thanks. So the first one is, yep, the first one is bounded by Gowanus Canal, Butler Street, Nevin Street, and Sackett Street. So it's this, this location right here. So here's the canal, and it's these three lots right here. So we listed to EPA at the end of September that that was our most preferred site based on the criteria that we've been using to numerically rank uh, these sites. Um, the second site, um, based on our ranking was the Thomas Green Playground. Um, and what we said to EPA in, in, our, in our response at the end of the month was, there's a long process here. From this point to when we go back to EPA and the community with the one site that we think makes the most sense is the end of June. And between now and June, there's a lot of things that still need to be looked at, including cost, what it would cost us to put the tanks in the various locations, and how the community feels about the various locations. So we are well aware of how the community feels about Thomas Green Playground. We've definitely heard that. We continue to hear that, um, and we take that very seriously. Um, I, I, as I mentioned, it was also our second ranking site based on the criteria. We also mentioned in our response that, um, and we've said this to uh, our elected leaders um, and to members in the community, is that we had to send two locations for that site but there were two additional locations that also ranked very closely to the Thomas Green site, our second site, that we also think needs further review in this process, which again goes to the end of June. So there's a, there's a long way to go, and we believe that there should be a significant community involvement into that process, and that's why we're here tonight, that's why we were here last month, talking about what the process has been and what it will be moving forward. Um, at the other end of the canal, Slide down, does that work? There we go. Maybe a little bit more. There we go. At the other end of the canal, we also identified two sites. Um, our most preferred site, based on the ranking, um, is bounded by Gowanus Canal and 2nd Avenue. Right here. The site right there. And then uh, the other site, which is uh, bounded by um, Gowanus Canal, 2nd Avenue, and 6th Street, is right here. And so, again, we'll go through the same process on that as well. Um, it's also worth mentioning that in addition to doing this analysis, we're also looking at other ways that we can reduce CSOs as directed um, that may not necessarily be a tank, that may be more cost effective. So that study is also ongoing at the same time as we're doing the, the tank siting study. No, not at all. Please, this is not the time now for question and answers, so let's give him the opportunity to explain where they are in the process. Then we're gonna go to NYCHA because I want for the residents of these developments that have not participated in other community meetings to have the opportunity to listen to the whole presentation. And then we will have an opportunity to ask questions. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, it's worth mentioning what Kevin just reminded is that the alternative analysis that we're doing is part of the long-term control plan that we are doing with the state DEC. And no, it is not a delay. We are, we are following the process as, uh, as written by EPA. Um, so that's sort of where we are right now on tank siting. And as I said, the next step in this process is that we have to get back to EPA by the end of June with the one location, our preferred location for both outfalls. Um, and uh, we will be back with, with the community uh, talking about how that process develops and, uh, and where we are. Um, it's worth noting, uh, Eric, that in this period of time, between now and June, the city will be doing other design work that is applicable to whichever of those locations gets selected. Because there's a lot of basic design work. How do you make the plumbing work? All of that stuff, that can be done and will be being done already starting now as they move towards that June 2015 date when they have to select a single site. Yeah, that part of the, yeah, part of the process is that we will be designing for these locations, uh, which will help us in the in the cost analysis too of which location makes the most sense. Uh, so that's where we are in tank siting. Happening to sort of shift gears and go to NYCHA. Uh, yes, Fantastic. Um, so at the outset, um, what when we were here last month, we heard lots of concerns about NYCHA. Um, we did come out uh, and we sort of checked the system. The, the sewers, the catch basins, we cleaned them. They're all functioning properly. Um, our commissioner um, has had a very recent conversation with, um, with the leadership at NYCHA. And what we've decided to do um, as a next step is we're going to form a, a working group of NYCHA and DEP. And we're going to come out together during a heavy rain event to see exactly how the system is working. You might just be upstairs tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Councilman, thank you. It, it actually hasn't rained that much. <laughs> um, and so that way we can see exactly how it's w working during a heavy rain event, and we can use, use that as a next step to really identify uh, if there's a problem and where there's a problem and what the best resolution is. Would you like to, you guys want to jump in and add? Thank you. Thank you. Sure. My name is Louis Ponce. I'm one of the vice presidents of operation at the Housing Authority. So how many uh, I had a great presentations from the EPA and from the New York City Department of Environmental Protection? Just by a show of hands, how many NYCHA residents do we have in the crowd? Great. Good representation. This is a great project, and it's going to affect you as a community, and NYCHA is definitely part of the community. So I'm glad that we had this kind of segue. So we started with the canal which is where some of the sewage ends up if it gets diverted from the sewage treatment plant. Then we had the New York City, the DEP, who handles the sewage after it leaves our buildings at NYCHA. So I'm going to talk a little about before it leaves our buildings at NYCHA. So it had come to our attention, I guess in the fall, maybe in the spring, of uh, one of the buildings that was getting a backup actually from the street. So it was coming in from uh, the DEP, pipes were clogged, and it was causing that kind of retention tank that they discussed that holds the water. So our building became the retention tank, right? So we ended up holding the sewage, which a resident should never have to live in those conditions. We work with the DEP very closely. We actually had to relocate the resident. <clears throat> we cleared it. We got it done. We haven't had an issue in months. We actually put another resident in that apartment, and it seems like they haven't had any issues. We have been checking. Okay, so let me just finish because I think I'm going to go where you're going to take me. And if you're not, you can absolutely get to me a question and answer. I'm not going anywhere. So, so, so this, the sewer system within a building, in any building, not only NYCHA, it comes down from every apartment. It goes into one pipe in the basement. From that pipe, it leaves the building. If the stoppage, if whatever's causing the stoppage is outside of the building, it will come into the building. What we're finding is it's not a DEP issue. It's our pipes. It's NYCHA pipes in the building. So while we have worked, we have done some. We have responded to issues where there were stoppages. We seem to have been successful, but if I'm not right, absolutely, we'll talk about it. <clears throat> okay, so then I will stand corrected. <laughs> but what we work with the DEP and what, what Eric had hinted about is what we're finding not only in Wyckoff and Gowanus, and we check Red Hook East and West, 
was what a lot of issues that are causing our stoppages is grease. And grease should not be put down the line. So, and a lot of people use the grease. They put it down, they push some hot water, it goes through, it's great in the kitchen sink. But what happens is if you see after you use grease, it, after you cook with it, it just kind of wants to solidify, right? It kind of gets hard. So when you put it down the pipe and it goes to hot water, when it gets it, it goes great. When it gets to that larger pipe that's affecting the whole building, those pipes are cold. And that's when it starts to solidify. So that pathway of 12 inches pipe or a 10 inch pipe to get out becomes smaller as it gets coated with the grease. It becomes smaller and smaller. When that becomes totally clogged, or when there's a rain event, what they're talking about a lot, so the rain is coming up from the, we have drains on our roofs that go down those same pipes. When the volume of that water is too much, it starts backing up, and where it backs up is the lowest level. It'll come up, it'll try to come up in the basement. There's no way to get out in the basement, it's gonna come up on those first floor apartments. And that's where we're finding the issue. That is a NYCHA issue. That is not the Gowanus Canal. That is not the DEP. So while we have worked with DEP on, on another development at Baruch Houses, we have cleared lines. We have instituted an informa a, a tr kind of like a training information to the residents to let them know. At one point, we even gave people containers where to dispose of their grease and to put them down the incinerator. It has been very successful. So what, what Eric was talking about is trying to emulate that over here and trying to stop those reoccurring stoppages. So I think... And our staff has actually already been, we have a specific unit that does outreach on Greece. They've already been in touch with uh, the NYCHA houses uh, to uh, set up a time where we can come and do a presentation, give out information, maybe give out some of those, so, no, excuse me, give out some of those supplies. So we'll work that through the, through the tenant association residents. We'll see what, what possibility we have to give that. But the supplies to put the grease is nothing unique. You can put them into a plastic container. You can put them into a, a, a milk carton. You can put them into something as long as we keep them out of those pipes. That's the main thing. And what we started with, with DEP and another site in Queens, which actually to use a mechanized enzyme treatment to eat up the grease before it's solidified into pipes. We haven't got results back from that, but we, maybe we can do something like that over here. Um, I would like to ask Brian, <coughs> When is going to be the next meeting uh, on resiliency for the development here? For, uh, for here, we, uh, we don't have one scheduled, but we can, I could work with Dan and be happy to we organize one. We need to have it, and the community, the residents, we're going to have a re resiliency measures uh, meeting. Remember, a chunk of money from the federal government is being uh, allocated for NYCHA. Uh, to work on resiliency measures for those developments. And you need to participate in those meetings. That That's meeting great. has to take place. Yep, and, and the, the Congresswoman <laughs> helped organize a meeting last night in Red Hook, which we got a very good response. Uh, you know, a lot of people participated. Really good information. We'd be happy to do that here as well. So, uh, so uh, we'll, we'll work at that. We'll be more information on in the next few weeks. Oh, yeah. 
development in the spring yes. you called me my office and we brought we brought a team to come out and uh, we will be glad to come out again too to follow up in this mr. Watt, mr. Watt was in your was was that your development uh, this morning um, so so we are gonna follow up on this and 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 if I don't I have uh, <laughs> you can. That's part of the initiative that we're doing with DEP that was mentioned as far as a resident education as to what not to throw like into the into the drain system like grease and having a team going around actually addressing some of the pipes that are clogged by the grease and clearing the the the, the pipes that are clogged by the by the grease as was done at Baruch houses so are you gonna have a, some type of Uh, yes, and we do that through the tenant associations. Absolutely. And our, our team has already been in touch with the tenant associations. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And we will continue then with questions. I just would like to take this opportunity to recognize the new assembly member, assembly member elect Joanne Simon. <laughs> Welcome. Any other question? Yes. Well, and if we do it that way, yes. make sure that it's open to all residents. Like, come to resident leaders. Don't necessarily have to go through the TAs or anything. Set up a committee of residents that will be engaged in this to offer these jobs to these tenants. Yes. Uh, let me just say that I am very encouraged by the new chair of NYCHA, New York City Housing. I met with her. I made it very clear that for the longest time now, I've been putting pressure on NYSHA to comply with Section 3. And given the fact that so much money will be used now to implement resiliency measures in every development, that this is an opportunity for job creation. They have um, an economic development and training program and Brian, I want you uh, to talk about this issue. Uh, this, this was a topic of discussion last night with the Red Hood community. And believe me, two things. One is EPA responsibility too, and I have addressed this issue with them. Uh, we need to have a job training uh, 
program in place, and we are working on, it, on that, and then NYCHA with the Sunday money. So, so you, you may have read recently that FEMA approved a $108 million contract for Coney Island Houses. That is one development within that was affected by Sandy. Red Hook, Gowanus, the other areas in this, the other developments in this area that were hit by Sandy will also receive a, a different allocation, probably much more than that $108 million because it, you know, the application is definitely much more and I know that we're, I'm very confident that we're gonna get more than that. So section three says that we, 15% of new hires have to come from NYCHA residents. We have made it a goal to not only meet that 15%, but we're going to surpass it. Now, how are we gonna make sure that the folks are local? One of the things that we talked about doing last night, and we can also do it you know, is here as well, we can do it back-to-back -back nights, you know, is doing local workshops where we tell people when to sign up, how to sign up, and how to get the training that they need. Because we wanna make sure that people know what's available and how to get it. The one thing you will need is, you know, especially for the construction uh, jobs, will be OSHA training. We could help provide that. You'll also need training in the skills that will be necessary to do the jobs. The folks who already have those skills, that'll be great and we can, we can certify them and make sure that uh, we get the, uh, the and, and the, remember the way the, the rules work too, is that the first people hired will be the people from that development. So if you were, if you were you know, signed up through Reese, um, and if you were signed up and you were skilled, you will get called first. So early, you know, signing up early, making sure that you get the uh, skills that you need for the jobs is really important, and we'll have more information on that later. We, we're going to be, we are going to be coordinating workshops in every development, okay? So now, any other questions related to, yes, Walter. Let me just say that this, the, super fund, the super fund program that Natalie talked about and I mentioned, that's a big, big project also. Hundreds of millions of dollars of construction money over a, an eight, nine, ten year period, starting somewhere in around 2017 is our best bet. Um, what we are committed to doing at EPA is to, is to work with the responsible parties. In this case, I'm happy to say that National Grid, which is one of the major responsible parties, is very, very supportive of this idea of having a job training institute which would be specifically targeted to local residents and particularly people who, are, who need the jobs, who haven't had as much employment as they, as they want, as they need. Give them the training so that they can take entry level and eventually more sophisticated positions in the environmental construction trade. Um, we've had good success with this in other areas. This is gonna be a big project. We have, there will be good jobs that will be available, and I'm very, very pleased that National Grid, which is likely to be the lead company that's going to actually manage the whole project, they're very committed, and uh, so we'll be able to provide training to some number of people, and then they're going to be committed to actually having their contractors hire those people. Now, the people are going to have to work, and they're going to have to do well, but we know from our experience that those folks who are motivated and get this training they will work well, and they will be able to get and keep those jobs. And so that's really important. For the federal government, the Superfund project, I'll let NYCHA talk for them, but we will probably create this job training institute about eight to 10 months before construction starts. But we're already working with National Grid now, we're already talking with National Grid now, so that when they do the design, remember Natalie explained that the design process is pretty complicated, it's going on for several years, they can already be thinking while they're doing, doing the design of what are the job trades that would be suitable for this kind of job training institute. 
let me let the NYCHA folks talk, and then I know you folks had questions as well. Sure. So, Ms. Corbett, um, at, uh, we have a training class that is going to start um, in the winter, so we will begin recruiting folks even be before that. So, you know, I would like to, you know, make sure that we hold a workshop here before the year ends, for sure. Yep, yep. Davis. I'm a Gowanus resident board member, also Fury board member. My question is, what are the environmental impacts on the ground and in the air for residents as they clean up the process to take place? And will this information research be publicly um, accessible to everybody? So I answer the second question first. Absolutely, yes. Uh, during the construction work, we are going to have a lot of monitoring going on. There'll be air, air monitoring going on. There'll be water monitoring going on. All of the data from the monitoring will be put up on a website. It'll be made available usually within days. It takes a while to go through the laboratory sometimes, but as soon as it's available to us, it'll be put on the website. Uh, and we will have regular meetings to explain it so that people can understand what they're looking at. Uh, the first part of your question is, will there be impacts? And the answer is, Yes, but we're going to manage them very carefully. That is, this muck that gets dug up, this is smelly stuff. So we're going to have to be very careful to make sure that when it's brought up out of the water, uh, there's as little odor issues as is possible. Uh, there will probably be some odors that you would smell if you were right along the banks of the canal. If you're very near where they're working, you'll smell something. Uh, frankly, that's true right now. When it's low tide, you probably, or if you're near the canal, you're going to smell something. So, but we're going to monitor that carefully. We're going to, there's a variety of things that can be done to keep those odors under control and to keep any dangerous air pollutants under control. We've got good experience managing that at other sites. All of that experience is going to be brought to play here so that we can manage it as well as possible. Can I guarantee you that there'll never be a smell? I can't guarantee that. Your noses are very, very sensitive and your noses actually smell things even before they become dangerous to you, which is why we evolved that way, because that's a good defense mechanism. Um, so I can't guarantee you'll never smell anything if you're right near the canal. But I can guarantee that we're going to make sure that it's not dangerous to anybody's health. OK. Any other questions? Yes. Sure. OK, I'm sorry. Where? In August, uh, I met with Scott Stringer under the patrol. Mm -hmm. He spoke about Section 3 and how that 2020 contractors come in on public housing and they bring their own people in and the kids in public housing don't get the jobs. So when you say 2020, what, they bring 20 people from the contractors in and 20 people from housing get yeah. the jobs? No, that's not the, it's, it's not a 2020 agreement. Well, it's not match for match. Yeah, it's 15 percent, right, exactly, new hires. But the patroller is saying, where's the study that is being, is happening in public housing? This, let me give you an example. Kawan is now, I think, um, the mayor has allocated uh, so much, so much money to do, I think they're doing the rules now. And you only have like maybe like three or four young men from public housing working there, and the rest of them are contractors are from their people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So where's the 15-15? Sir, the law requires that when a contract, we bring in a prime contractor to perform a job That's in NYCHA, right. they are required to in. hire 15% from within public housing residents. It has not been uh, done properly right. before, but they know that it's the new administration and we didn't have oversight. And so 
Why no not? one was watching what was happening. From now on, we will be working with the city administration. Look, if we want to reduce unemployment, and if we want to also address the issue of lack of revenues coming from the federal government, the best way to do it is by training people, 20,000 residents who are unemployed, able bodies, that if we could provide the training, they will be getting the jobs. We are going to make sure that NYCHA does what is required by law from these contractors. Otherwise, they should be punished, and next time they should, not, they should be forbidden from uh, uh, getting any contracts with, uh, with New York City Housing Authority. So who's, who's overseeing to see that if they're doing it now? Has to be NYCHA. NYCHA has to make sure that the contractors hire and comply with the, the goals established by Section 3. That's and we're going to be watching. I promise you we're going to be watching. Yes. Uh, late. Yes, ma'am. Wouldn't it have made sense just to dredge it and seal the Gowanus Canal and we don't have to worry about the sewer, the uh, flooding in the um, densely populated area? That's right. And then make it a, like something more land for affordable housing, right. more development. Right, we're tired of the Gowanus Canal. They had an old fire really well, I was thinking of the same thing. Well, the question, uh, because, uh, you didn't because, hear, the question is, wouldn't it be easier or better to simply dredge the canal and then fill it completely in? And uh, it, it doesn't work. That'll actually make your flooding situation much, much worse. The problem that one of the reasons that there is a, a fair amount of flooding is because this area, as Natalie's presentation showed, 140, 150 years ago, this was an area that had a creek. There were wetlands, marshes, swamps around the creek. They would absorb the rainwater when it rained, and that's what this area was all about. When the canal was built, the areas around the canal were filled in, and houses and warehouses and factories and so on were built. That prevents the water from being able to go anywhere, so it ends up getting into people's basements and maybe even contributing to the backups into the houses, I don't know, but uh, the more you fill in, the worse it actually becomes for flooding. Now, the other thing is this. Um, this is, different people will have different views about this, but people want to live near water. Uh, even, as strange as it seems, near water that's still a little bit dirty. I think right now people are attracted to the Gowanus area because they believe that the water is going to get cleaner. It is going to get cleaner. The state, the city, the federal government are all finally, after 100 years, working together. You heard it, that we're all working together right now for the same goal, which is to clean this canal and clean the water. It's never going to be swimmable. It's not going to be water that you want to go swimming in or you should go swimming in. Frankly, even when it was a creek 150 years ago, you probably wouldn't have been very desirable to go swimming in it because it was a marsh. But it'll be much, much, much cleaner. There will be critters, animals, plants that'll be living in it. There'll be very attractive areas around it, which will be nice for the people who live here uh, to go and walk and to look at. Uh, and you've seen some of that already in some of the areas that are, you know, where some, like at Lowe's, you saw that on the picture, the little, little park along the way there. Actually, Whole Foods did it as well, right? They, they put a little, whole, a little park around the canal. <laughs> everything that you need to flood everything out. Uh, it, is, it is theoretically possible that if you covered it all up and put huge pipes down the middle of it, all of the water that now flows in the canal and comes out of the sewer systems and so forth could go further downstream. Then it would end up coming out at Red Hook. And the Red Hook folks would be very, very disturbed if that was the outcome which is that all of the sewage that now 
comes down the canal, if it was all concentrated and came out only at Red Hook instead of being actually cleaned up, I think they would also be very unhappy about it. It's Red Hook on one side, and what's the uh, Sunset Gardens on the other side? I think both of those communities would be unhappy about it. So these are legitimate ideas, and they have been discussed at some length over the years. Uh, personally, I think the downsides way out would outweigh the, the, the benefits, but you know, it's something that we've been talking about and we've been thinking about, so it's a, it's a completely valid and legitimate idea. Okay, so we only have 15 more minutes. Uh, the gentleman, yes? I do the same things you don't understand, okay? But just remember, I'm, I'm gonna try to do the best I can. We, we moved in Gowanus. Opening day, June 30th, 1949. I was one year old. Come from Harlem Hospital. Come from the Robinsons, Jackie Robinson. That's my family. That's my mother's cousin. We come from South Africa. We've been in this country for 240 years. Okay, now, I lost my car. I lost my vehicle. I spoke to you. I lost my vehicle during Hurricane Sandy. The Guanas Canal rose up over the banks. First time in the history of this area. I've been in this neighborhood 65 years. I only know one person in this room. That's Mr. Tyler right there, Ed. Grew up together here. My mother's window was the first window on Bond Street down from the Guanas Canal. We smelled it all of the time. She had to keep her windows closed. We smelled it all of the time. Now, my registration on my car expired four days before Hurricane Sandy. My car was underwater, under the Guanas Canal. The water went into the projects and knocked the power out. Okay, a lot of people lost property. I lost a Lincoln Continental. I've been patient because I feel that the people that lost their homes come before me because I got a roof over my head in NYCHA. I live in Whitecourt now. Raised my daughter here, 21 years. You're talking about 2017. Well, in 2018, I'll be 70 years old, all right? So I ain't got too much time left on the clock. This is what I'm saying. I pleaded my case in Stephen Levin's office. When my car came from underneath that water, I tried to restore that, that car. Lisa told me in Stephen Levin's office, he said, Arthur, don't get in that car because it's chemical damage in that car and you're gonna catch something. Say, so if it's biological, you could clean the car. I stopped cleaning it because of what she said, being mindful. I hope you can still understand what I'm saying. I've heard a lot of pipe dreams come through this area. So I truly do believe that you guys believe what you were told about straightening out that Gowanus Canal, because it, it is a monster. It's some kind of a living thing in it. All right, this is what I'm saying. I don't know how much power is in this room. I know how much is in me. I asked you during the elections, could you help me out? The governor I worked with, the mayor, the district uh, council member, uh, the, the public advocate, all you guys. That's a lot of power. I haven't sent the letter off to the president yet. I'm asking, who's going to help me get my possessions back? That's my car. That's, that's how I get my family around. My, I'm on a fixed budget. My registration ran out four days before Hurricane Sandy. I don't get a pardon. I lose a whole car. We've lost property in this, in this area. I lost a whole car. I've been patient for two years, going on the anniversary Sir, now. Who I, do I, I talk I to? I wish I could give you an answer, but I regulations are regulations. And when FEMA built on the gates, they could have have the requirements. Right, I'm asking for other people, it doesn't matter that I am the congresswoman, it doesn't matter, Steve Levin, regulations are regulations. And so many other families still, still didn't get any help 
because they either didn't have the documents or the requirements. There's nothing else that we can do. Was my pre-registration. I don't get my money. I'm on Social Security. I'm over 65 years old. I had to wait for my money to come in in order to re-register my car. My car was underwater. I went to the motor vehicles. I tried to re-register the car. The gentleman said, didn't you just say that your car was underwater? I said, yeah. He said, well, then bring the plates in so we can destroy them because your car okay, no okay. longer operates. We don't want to solve this issue here tonight. Let me give the gentle lady here an opportunity. She has been patiently with her hand here. And then I would like to ask um, the assembly member elect Joanne Simon to say a few words. Do I see before. her? Who do I see on my match? You could come to my office again and we will call FEMA and we will set up a meet, another meeting with FEMA. But there's nothing else that I can do. Yes. I'll give you a little bit of my background. I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. I've been trying for maybe 55 years since I moved to New York from Portland, Oregon. Um, the first job I had after college was working for the city. To Can you stage the question? Well, yes. yeah. Well, I'm concerned because I lived. Through, I moved in day after the hurricane happened. And to, on um, President and uh, Bond. And luckily, I mean, a tanker blew up and I got scared that the sparks would contain fire and so on. But I'm, I, and now I'm concerned about the 700 unit that would add the population. And with the container tanks and all that is in the planning for, you know, the muck. And where will the muck go? Not in my backyard or something like that? I mean, the idea that this woman had about, I grew up in Chinatown, Canal Street is the same thing. It was a canal and look what it is now, an enterprising business, a residential, even though it's low income, below the medium low poverty income. And for four years, I've been sitting at the, at the meetings to determine the prevention of gentrification in that area. And nothing is coming about with that. You understand? The only recommendation that the Pratt development referred to us because Canal had jewelry stores that we should have jewelry workshops. Does that make sense? Somebody from the top telling us about you giving me a diamond? This is, re I mean, you yeah. know. There's going to be a meeting with by Councilman Bradlander, and that will be the appropriate place to raise this issue. Here we're talking about cleaning up the, the Moanas Canal, but, but there is going to be a meeting, I believe, in November. So I will. Uh, I'm just concerned about the health, the health of the people. You're you know, concerned about what? The health, you know, because yes, we, hear health. Lot, we, we, talk, we hear a lot of contamination. So okay? We hear a lot of contamination and all of that. So I wonder whether all this is going to affect the people living around here. Around the canal or the project. He said he hears about a lot of the canal contamination that's going on. Yeah. So how is it going to affect the people around the canal and the air quality and especially public housing residents? Is that, is that any issue? The question is whether people's health right now is being affected by the canal. Is that the question? Right. So if you live near the canal, the canal is not adversely affecting your house. If you were, there are some people who live on houseboats in the canal, or on the canal. That's probably not a good idea in my judgment. Uh, there are people who go canoeing and kayaking on the canal. That's okay as long as they don't tip over and fall in. Um, but if you, 
the canal water itself is contaminated, but unless you're in contact with it, it's not going to do anything with you, to you. Now, the question came up. In fact, the gentleman with the car had the question. His car got flooded out during Hurricane Sandy, and he was concerned that if there was biological contamination, that could be cleaned off. But if there was chemical contamination, then he shouldn't do it. We tested the flood water the day of the Hurricane Sandy. And in fact, there were no levels of chemicals that were of concern. There were very high levels of bacteria. Why? Because the sewers overflowed. It's in a big rainstorm. That's what happens when the sewers overflow. So actually, your car was probably contaminated, if at all, by bacteria, biologicals, and not by chemicals. So if the flood water gets into your home, on that occasion when the one time in 100 years where the, sand, where the canal overflowed its banks, if the flood water gets into your home, it is dangerous, but it's dangerous because of bacteria, not because of chemicals. It's, and so that's an important distinction. And there are things you can do to protect yourself on the bacteria. You can, there is information. We have lots of it. Yes, we can provide that. Yeah. If you're in the canal, it's not a good idea. It's not fun. Yeah. What's in it? Hurricane Sandy, storm surge came in, what a huge amount of relatively clean water from the ocean. And that's what was flooding out. Walter, uh, John, come here, please. And I just, um, then you're going to follow Ariel, a member of the CAC committee. This is our new assemblywoman elect, Joanne Simon. And I want to thank her because she hasn't taken office yet and she's here tonight. But she has always been very active in the community, especially dealing with those issues that are important to this community. Thank, thank you. you, Congresswoman. And uh, thank you all for, for coming tonight, for being here tonight, for staying so late. I noticed that a number of young people have a better idea, which is they're already taking a nap. And uh, I'm very envious. Uh, I just want to say that I'm, uh, crazy as it may sound, I am looking forward to working with all of you on these very difficult issues. They're important issues. We've been living with these issues for a long time, and I'm looking forward to making sure that living with these issues is something that is easier to do, um, and that we're protecting the public's health and uh, uh, making sure that our children are growing up in a cleaner environment and aren't going to be affected by uh, uh, the pollution in the Gowanus Canal. Uh, so I'm looking forward to working with everybody, and I want to thank you all, and I want to thank the Congresswoman, and uh, I noticed that uh, uh, Brad has left. I'm working already with the local elected officials on these issues uh, to make sure that uh, we're all communicating uh, before uh, I would take office on January 1st, provided everybody comes out and votes on November 4th. So, thank you. Yes. And as you have seen, there are so many important questions that have been asked. And maybe when you leave this room, more questions still lingering. So it is important for you to come and participate in the meetings that are taking place. And so we have Ariel here, and she will talk to you about the next CAC meeting. Hi, my name is Ariel Krasnow. I'm a member of the Gowanus Canal Community Advisory Group. And many thanks have already been offered to all of the agencies that have come out, and in particular to um, Congresswoman Velasquez's office her, and Congresswoman herself for organizing this event and also just for being a champion for many, many years for getting us to this point. And I think she started by talking about participation, and I think we'll end again by talking about participation. And the, um, the community advisory group is is a forum like this once a month, and every month the EPA comes out and brings us up to date on all of the issues, and it's fully open to the public. Any, anyone can come and listen and hear and have questions. If they're very interested, they're welcome to join, in which case they can help to, to actually, it's a community advisory group. So we listen, but we also give feedback. And over the last couple, it, the, uh, I, Natalie did a lovely job of doing the, the timeline. Um, there's a sheet of paper in the back there. In her timeline, everything is described on this sheet here. This is 
But there was one thing she left out, which was the formation of the Community Advisory Group. And that happened in 2010. <laughs> and as you can see, we started here. We've come down to here now. And in that course of time, there are many committees about water quality. There's a committee about um, the, the, we're part of the outreach, I'm part of the outreach committee. There are a number of ways that you can be involved. And there are many questions that come up. And so this is a place for your voice to be heard and for you to help to have some impact on, on the, we still, we're here at 2014 and we have till 2021 or 22. So there's a lot of time left, a lot of issues, and we hope very much that you'll join us. Um, the next meeting is on October 28th at 6.30 at 41 First Street in Brooklyn at the Mary Star of the Sea. We, mo we have them there, we've had them here, and there's on this sheet, there's a website. There's also on the sheet a number of other contacts you can go to. The EPA website has a tremendous amount of information that can answer a lot of the questions that you have. And you can also, there's many, many of us are here tonight. And in fact, I think, you know, Mary Ann spoke so passionately about the, this, the, the, the effort to cite the, and study for the, the tanks. These are the kind of issues that will be coming up for the next, uh, how many years is that now? Oh, it's, uh, oh eight. 10, 15, Eight, 10. many, many years. So come join us. And um, I don't know if I'm the one signing off for tonight, but I just want to, I'm also a CAG member on the outreach committee. And I do want to say that all the meetings that we're talking about are open to the public. You don't need to be a CAG member, but we do encourage membership. So you can come to the meetings, they're open. Um, and there's also an outreach committee meeting this Friday morning at 8.30 at the Fifth Avenue Committee Building at 621 DeGraw Street. So that meeting is open as well, and you're free to come and uh, discuss these issues with us there as well, as well as the full CAG meeting on the 28th. But they're open to the public. Everybody is invited. So that's important to mention. I understand there is a last meeting, a last question regarding the tanks, the uh, siding of the tanks. Dave Powell, Fifth Avenue Committee. Um, we're, like many others in this room, very excited to see all the agencies working together and look forward to working with you and moving this process forward in a way that really benefits our communities. My question is for DEP. Um, I heard you say earlier, sir, that you heard the message loud and clear that the community felt the sighting or potential sighting of the tanks on parkland was problematic, being our only community park. Um, our only public pool. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna quite beat you up on that, but I but in order to understand a little bit for now, <laughs> but because I, I'm hearing you, I'm hearing I'm gonna take you at your word that you've heard that message loud and clear. And you should. But but to in, but to inform um, dialogue going further, I'd like to ask you if you could give us some sense of the size and the scope of those tanks. For example, are we talking about something that would take up a quarter block, a half block? Are we talking about something that would um, necessitate um, all of the site or par portion of the site being out of community use for part of the time, all of the time? You know, can you give us some scope of where we are with those tanks? So Kevin Clark is our project manager specifically on the tanks, which is why I asked him to join uh, me this evening in case a specific question like that came up. Kevin? Sure. So right now, um, we're on the hook for a, an 8 million gallon tank uh, for RH34. And uh, we estimate that um, rough square footage, we're, we're talking about 100,000 square feet that would be required for the tank. Now, the tanks are, are mostly constructed underground. So if we were to use the, the double uh, deep pool site for um, that tank, um, basically that entire block would be taken up during the duration of the construction. Um, but as I mentioned, um, the tank itself is mostly underground. Uh, above ground facilities are required, you know, for housing electrical equipment, pumping equipment, um, personnel facilities, that sort of thing. And that's roughly about a third of uh, the required um, footprint. So in the long term, um, you know, there's the possibility that 
two, roughly two-thirds of the site still could be made available um, as open spaces. I'm, we're not committing to that, but you know, that is something that could potentially happen. So we're talking, again, using, <laughs> using the, the square block of, of the Douglas Green Park and the pool site as an example, and again, we're it, just putting out there once again that we're not accepting that as, a <laughs> as an alternative that we would like to see. And that's not an insignificant point, great. is that it, we did a numerical ranking. Uh -huh. Based on that numerical ranking, it was the second site based on that ranking. Not our, not our number one ranked site. And there were other sites that were sites three and four based on that numerical ranking very closely okay. to the Thomas Green site. And all of that needs further evaluation. Okay, okay. So, but just so if I understand you correctly, you're saying if, if that site were selected, that would be a, a one third of, of that square block taken offline permanently. Roughly. Yes. And, and the entire square block taken over during construction. All right. There's also a remediation issue with that park, which we won't get into right now, right? But we'll, okay, we'll we look forward to. And could you tell us a little bit more about this meeting in mid-November that will be? It's the the long-term control plan meeting, uh, which is part of the uh, the effort uh, under DEC with DEP, the DEC the DEC regulation with DEP to reduce the amount of CSO into the Gowanus Canal. That's the kickoff meeting. That's November 19th, and I believe the date the location is still to be determined. But I think it's at one of the uh, I think our plan is at one of the public schools here in the neighborhood. And we'll, we'll send out notification through elected community boards. And there'll be an opportunity to speak more on the tanks and the siting issue and selection. That one's not about tanks. That's about the, I mean, that's more about the, the long-term control plan and the, and the state, whereas the tanks are federal government. Um, but we'll be having more meetings on tanks. We will be, yes. To the public. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. that the park is an old MGP site and is heavily contaminated and that in order to get the cleanup that this community deserves and has been waiting for for decades, I think that takes precedent. And what I heard from DEP today is, or this evening is that you know, they prefer to go ahead and to put the tanks on private land which means that they, it needs to be taken by eminent domain. It will cost the city a lot more money that they can be using to give us the pool back after the retention, take, uh, uh, retention tanks are put right back there. So I think that the Fifth Avenue Committee, maybe the representative or as a group, is a little bit misguided because I think the city is going to use exactly those arguments to make this even more expensive and to put the tank on public land, which is pro uh, on private land, which is going to probably take years and years and years to acquire and to find, which gives exactly the city what it has been doing for, for a long, long time, which is to shortchange this community. We should not go ahead and make a lengthier process. We should go ahead and listen to the EPA and to the expertise, they're the only agency that have advocated for this, com uh, for this community for, forever. So, I'm happy thank to you. you more no. about that, I think it's DEP that's doing the siting uh, selection. So, a question that um, is being asked, or... Uh, Can you commit, please, DEP and Mike just into here tonight. Can you please commit to having a representative attend uh, the, the, the monthly CAG meetings so we can continue this dialogue and work better together. So, in full disclosure, I've been at DEP four months, so I can't speak to the, the long-term history of CAG. My understanding is there have been times that we have attended CAG meetings and we've been told not to speak. Um, and to leave. Uh, I, so I don't know if, if there's great validity in that or not. Well, uh, but you, you could share with the commissioner that it has been raised. I will and share. That, and and that absolutely. it would be healthy, healthy for this process if the agency is represented. We I absolutely think. will share that with the commissioner. And the commissioner did attend a CAG meeting in June where she talked about this. Um, and obviously, we're having lots of meetings in the local community because we think that, too, is important. Okay. And now, now, now uh, 
we're going to have, I know, Natalie, uh, she's going to share with us some more information. Um, something, something very quickly. Um, I left some flyers in the back of the room. On November 20th, EPA is hosting a symposium. Um, for those who don't know, there are actually three Superfund sites in New York City. Um, one, of course, is the Gowanus Canal. Uh, the second is Newtown Creek. And the third, which has just recently been listed, is Wolf Alpha. Port. That's out in um, the border between Queens and, and Brooklyn. Um, anyway, we are going to be hosting a symposium um, to introduce and explain Superfund to the larger community. And we thought it would be a good idea for representatives from Gowanus, who surprisingly, you may not think so, but you actually probably have the most knowledge about Superfund sites out of all of the, the three communities. And we thought it would be a good idea if the three communities got to meet one another and share their experiences. EPA will be there. We're hoping to see many of the same faces I'm looking out at now. We really would be happy to see you there and for you to share, you know, we do a lot of talking to you. We would like for you to not only talk to us, but to talk to one another about your experiences with Superfund. So the flyer is in the back of the room. It's November 20th from 6 to 9 p.m. at Brooklyn Borough Hall. Thank you so much. Thank you. And if you do attend, if you do attend, you, you will be helping me out because Newtown Creek is also in my district. And I am not sure now in terms of the uh, borders of that new, uh, oh, please. I have the distinction of having three super fun sites in my district. Anyway, so let me, let me take this opportunity and thank NYCHA residents and all the community for being here. Please keep it up. I need you also to come to these meetings. It's important. Look at the wealth of information uh, that will be beneficial for everyone. To all the agencies, to EPA, to NYCHA, and DEP, thank you so very much for being here today. And CAC members. <laughs>